sponsored by the Dagama Group. Welcome to Rombo Minero. Welcome, Cesar. How are you? What a pleasure, Jorge, as always. Well, to tell you the truth, we are a little alarmed at the moment with what Cesar is saying about the port of Chanque. The truth is that it is a shame that the National Port Authority says that it has a mistake of its own and that at this point 75% of the work has already been completed. It does not occur to an official. In addition, we have the understanding of third level in the hierarchy and leave us in a bad light worldwide. How can it be that the president of the National Port Authority, Mr. Walter Tapia, with you? In office, Kesa. Totally agree, Jorge. And it is the shame of the economic news of the week, and it will be precisely one of the topics we will be addressing. Will be one of the topics that we will address with our first interviewee, who is Luis Miguel Castilla, former Minister of Economy and Finance and Director of the Videnza Institute. Videnza Institute, because this is certainly a scandal anywhere in the world. Just in the year of OPEC, announced the presence of one of the leaders of the world economy, such as Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping, President of the People's Republic of China, who is coming to inaugurate. And we are putting the rim down on this issue, it seems to me. I should call on Minister Raul Perez Reyes of Transportation and Communications. He has to put order in the National Port Authority. This is a mess. This is a mess. And the truth is that we are saying it here. We say things as they are. And of course, we have to go back on this issue because we are really on the verge of not being on the verge. APEC has already started in Peru. And we are going to have the president, as Cesar rightly says, of China inaugurating and having an issue that has also been a mistake of the port authority itself. It is the last straw. I hope that the minister can make a quick decision on the matter. And we will also be with Brendan Oviedo. He is president of the Peruvian Society of Renewable Energies. And we will try to talk about the portfolio of renewable energy projects in Peru. Next, we go to the main meaning news of the week by Gabriela Chicoma. Thank you, Jorge. These are the main mining news of the week. Nexa Resources Peru, which operates the country's largest subway zinc mine, Cerro Lindo, in Ica, filed an application with the Geological, Mining and Metallurgical Institute, Ingemed, to obtain a 1-0 hectare concession in Cajamarca. The Congress of the Republic published the Law for the Promotion of Green Hydrogen, which aims to promote research, production, transformation, commercialization, export and use of green hydrogen, export and use of green hydrogen as fuel and energy vector in its different applications. The Minister of Energy and Mines, Romulo Mucho, highlighted that his administration is moving forward in giving a greater impulse to mining investment because it is the right way to generate jobs and defeat poverty. He assured that the sectors involved are working together to promote and speed up the projects which is the only way to boost economic growth. Many thanks to Gabriela Chicoma for the main mining news of the week. Well, we are now joined by Luis Miguel Castilla, former Minister of Economy and Finance and Director of Evidenza Instituto. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the mining investment projects for 2024, among other things, such as the subject also, of course, of the interpolation to the minister very much. Welcome, Lucho. How are you, Luis? Jorge, thank you for the invitation. Luis Miguel, tell us a little bit. The government indicated that it's making progress in the elaboration of a specific bill for artisanal and small-scale mining. In small-scale mining, following the repeal of a legal provision that expedites the terms of the mining formalization process, precisely the Legislative Decree 1607, of Legislative Decree 1607, you consider that the government has been weak in its response to the bad actions of Congress, to the bad actions of Congress. In other words, what has happened is that in the end, there has been a bit of fear among et fear. I think that some congressmen are involved. It has already been demonstrated. They are involved or have been subsidized to their campaign by illegal miners. And on the other hand, I believe that the president does not even have the percentage to be able to say no to anything. So we are in a terrible, vicious circle that is the underlying issue, Jorge, because the weakness of the government means that the efforts, to promote the, the efforts they make to promote mining investment in the country to attract capital is erased. To attract capital are erased with another hand 
due to the endemic weakness of the government that allows itself to be overwhelmed by a Congress that obviously responds to subordinate interests. In this case, the interests of illegal mining, which has led to the pronouncements of the mining society and the business sector, and it is necessary to be consistent. And what this government shows is that it is not able to stress the importance of investment and to fight against the scourge of illegal mining and all its aspects and all its aspects. And that is why we have to be and consistent. All its aspects and the insecurity crisis that affects the country, that affects the country. We are going to grow this year if effective action can be taken against criminality, much of it linked to illegal mining, which is rampant in the country. Illegal mining that is rampant in the country. But here we have the picture, Miguel, of the weakness of the state. No, we cannot ignore that. Because it is not only a question of whether a government acts or not, but whether it has the instruments and the results. Just look at what has happened with the Chanke port issue that shows you how it is possible that at this point in time, that at this point in time in authority, we have made an administrative error and it does not proceed giving a tremendous, and it does not proceed giving a tremendously negative signal at the international level. I also transfer this to what Jorge was talking about. The issue of the management of legal migration gives the impression that the government does not find that the, the state, government does not find in the state it has inherited the sufficient enough levers to be able to face it. In any case, what reforms should we make to the what fundamental reforms should we make to the public structure so that the response would be much more effective? I believe that it is more a matter of political reform, but certainly the signals that it gives are totally inconsistent and incoherent. And the importance of this is questioned by a low-level official at this stage of the game. Then what this does is that the country becomes unpredictable. The rules of the game that are not respected scares away investment. What is it that I wanted to highlight? Forgive me for just saying that the ministers with very good will course the most. Goes to the PDAC in Canada, says that Peru has guarantees to be able to attract investment, to be able to attract investment. But these are precisely the signals that obstruct the possibility of these investments flowing. Here, the public sector is upside down. Those who are below are the ones who finally dictate and decide things. And this makes the minister of the sector look bad. In this case, the minister of transportation, who has had to back down on an investment that is so transcendental and puts use before, let's say, the world as a country that is moving, I believe that this, plus other events that violated the legal security of the country, do a disservice to the reactivation that is so longed for in the country and so necessary. What should President Dina Boluarte do? President Dina Boluarte should do at this time to counteract or the premier to counteract and put order with respect to this issue because the Chinese company has already the Chinese company is saying that at least putting a claim no this 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 has to be fixed quickly from the recent statements made by the minister of transportation i believe that he is going to back down and probably they are going to leave that official without a footing but the delicate thing is the signal of the march and the counter march. So I think that having a president with so much weakness who is beset by scandals which do not stop with a government that has been weakened, I think we have a much weaker premier than the one we had before. And a Congress that is questioning the ministers with a gate, and it is every week, this is going to grow. So I do not see much political capacity or capital that the president can use to put order in a hen house that has become the government, where one says one thing, another says another thing. And finally, it is the image of the country that has been damaged. But we are closing the first quarter of the year and there are signs of economic recovery, which is evident and clear. Clear and evident, even a little bit with a margin beyond what was foreseen due to the rebound effect than what we were going to have this year. How much more of this can be leveraged to guarantee that the national economy will enter into a... The national economy is going to enter into a dynamic that is at least attractive for those investments? Look, most analysts are updating upwards the growth forecast, lower inflation, interest rate reductions, the weather phenomena that are finally subsiding, and a year that was initially... And a year that initially looked relatively calm in the political sphere, 
which has not been the case. Important reforms have been approved. Bicameralism is an important reform to hopefully have better laws approved in Congress in the future. But unfortunately, what has not fully recovered is the confidence of the economic agents. There are three months of recovery according to the central bank surveys, but these signals do not help this recovery. So this year, we can certainly grow two and a half or three percent, but the country, as was said by the Minister of Economy, must grow four or five percent at least. And this differential is explained by the mining investments and other sectors that are certainly harmed by these comings and goings and countermarches, despite the efforts to speed up the private investment follow-up team of the MEF, which is playing a quite commendable role in unblocking investments. It has already achieved the expansion of Antamina and other projects. They are expanding the portfolio of projects that are being monitored. Hopefully, the single digital window is already working. There are 10 entities that are working to standardize their processes. But all this will remain a dead letter if the main thing, which is the legal security of the country and the seriousness of what is said, is not fulfilled. If there are doubts regarding this, all these efforts will cause the reactivation to be only 25 or 2 percent at the most if there is no seriousness on the part of those who govern us, either in the executive or in the legislative power. Now to conclude, Luis Miguel, you are president of the Investment Climate Markets and Prices Forum, one of the forums that will be held at Expomina in September. Definitely the topic of investment, what we are talking about is precisely the markets and prices as it is towards the end of the year. As it is towards the end of the year. Uh, I see that in spite of all this situation, mining has a transcendental role. It has already been said in the PDAC that only 1.5% of the national territory is exploited and explored. We have an enormous window of opportunity given by the energy transition that is going to be intensive in metals such as copper. We have an enormous potential. The country's costs to produce copper in the country are competitive. We have improved lately in the Fraser dictator of attracting mining investment. Then I think there are the elements to position the country and recover the lost ground. But again, these setbacks in mining, in the fight against illegal mining, these continuous senses of political crisis in the country, and this disaffection of the powers of the state, including the judiciary, which has its problems, as well as the public prosecutor's office, which makes the country less attractive to long-term investment. So we have a great opportunity and the forum that I have to participate in and chair a whole important group is to bring international issues, how is project financing, what are the opportunities, and that Peru is not left behind since there are so many opportunities and mining can certainly pull the sustainable recovery of the country. Well, thank you very much, Luis Miguel Castillo, former Minister of Economy and Finance and Director of Evidencia Instituto. Thank you very much for being with us. And of course, we are moving forward with the preparations for Expomina. My pleasure, Jorge. Thank you. Well, Gabi, do you have some information about Expomina? Thank you very much. Expomina Peru from September 11th to 13th, 2024, will be chaired by Luis Rivera, Executive Vice President of Golfis Las Americas, and integrated by an advisory board of renowned mining leaders that will support us to achieve a magnificent organization. Highlight your brand through the different sponsorships we offer at Expomina Peru. Networking opportunities, participation in exclusive activities, promotion in the media, among other important benefits. For more information, visit our website, www.expominaperu.com. Well, entering the America Mining Block, we are now linking directly with Jose Gonzalez from Wall Street, New York. How are you, Jose? How are you? I'm very well. Nice to meet you. Please. Always with you. Tell us, Jose, the government of Gustavo Petro has proposed a mining law that proposes to prohibit new coal exploration and exploitation contracts establishing a framework for the expropriation of mining assets under certain circumstances that are happening in Colombia with the sector. And well, it is worrying, isn't it? Because this ideology is also present in several South American countries. 
because it does not talk much with mining. Right. Jorge, since his campaign, Gustavo Petro has shown to be opposed to oil exploration and export. He is already promoting from the government a public consultation to legislate with a new mining law for the provision of new copper exploration and production contracts, aligning Colombia in a certain sense with the European Union in what, excuse me, of coal, in what refers to the coal. Already the Petro government had rejected the signing of new has already rejected the signing of new coal and oil contracts with the legislative initiative prohibiting by law the action of new licenses for the bidding of coal. This proposal, as you point out, also includes an initiative to expropriate mining assets for use in reindustrialization, energy transition, agricultural development, and public infrastructure. The vast majority of Colombian mining, practically half of it, is mainly coal and together with oil. Coal accounts for half of Colombia's exports, making it difficult to completely discard coal production. This makes it difficult to completely eliminate coal production, as has happened with oil production, which has not been able to be eliminated. According to the Colombian Mining and Energy Planning Unit, the country's mining regulations have been demanding legal clarity for more than 20 years. The UPME, as it is known, argues that the legislative proposal is a call to reevaluate and make a critical analysis of the current mining law, promoting the necessary reforms and adjustments that will allow for a true planning of the mining sector. The law, according to the UPME, would define mechanized mining, establishing the legal security that should be conferred to ethnic communities and strategic minerals in order to improve decisions, investment and legal stability of the sector. Is this initiative different from the Panamanian initiative that prohibited open pit mining by cancelling First Quantum's contract for copper production for strictly political reasons? As Jorge points out, there are initiatives in the region in terms of mining. Brazil has just published its new regulations for critical minerals, which are quite extensive and detailed. This is a reflection of this Colombian initiative of a new attitude towards mining, promoting a regulatory framework that takes into account social and environmental issues, as was raised at the PDAC this year. Since coal is involved, the legislation in Colombia has not been unwelcome due to its level of pollution. However, its production cannot be completely eliminated because of the need for coke for the production of coal. However, its production cannot be completely eliminated due to the need of coke for steel production and we will see after the consultation what are the details and the discussion of this particular law, especially regarding expropriations. The consultation for the legislative initiative expires this March. On the other hand, Jose, there have been several reports published by Bloomberg and Reuters agencies a few days ago in which they report, a few days ago in which they report, according to my perspective, for the first time at least that we see it being we see that they are addressing it of the debt of the Chilean company. Chilean company Codelco, this great copper producer which has such a primacy in the international market and it also, international market and details, and also goes into more detail that precisely in order to maintain its status as a producer, perhaps they have carried out extra budgetary operations that take them out of the, from the matrix they had as cost to be able to cover, as cost to be able to cover all those investments. Tell us in detail what Bloomberg and Reuters say about this issue. Cesar, as we have discussed in the past, we knew that Codelco has production, legal and debt problems, but we did not know the details. They had not been published in detail. These two reports begin to shed light on what is really going on at Codelco. According to Bloomberg, Codelco placed two tranches, two debt placements for a total of $2 billion in January, increasing its debt levels and making it the copper company with the highest indebtedness at a global level, being leveraged that is indebted at 5.8 times its earnings. Its earnings, these debt issues, to the extent that they have to include financial information, will begin to shed light on what is happening financially in the company. And Bloomberg points out that indebtedness is essential in order to revitalize old deposits and compensate for an erosion in the quality of the concentrates that have experienced their biggest fall in 25 years due to errors and delays in projects. After several decades of disinvestment, Codelco embarked on a $40 billion investment plan without modifying the bylaws that oblige it to give 10% of its net sales, not profit, to the armed forces and 70% of its net income to the state. 
forcing it into constant indebtedness, according to Bloomberg. The company's current total debt is $20 billion, and according to Sesco, an economic think tank in Chile, it could increase to $30 billion by the end of this decade. According to Reuters, the debt problem in production is the result of the Chuchiki Camada subterraneo mining project, which has sought to transform the open pit mine into a subway mine at a cost of US $5 billion. The PMCHS, as the project is known, is one of four so-called structural projects designed to extend the life of the mines and compensate for the falling concentrates. In the case of Chuchikikamata, the project could extend the mine's life by 50 years, but the mine, according to Reuters, is plagued by delays, collapses and construction difficulties, as well as accidents that have caused it to produce only over 260,000 metric tons instead of 380,000 metric tons. Instead of the planned 385,000 metric tons. Planned. What is happening with Codelco is that the ideas of transforming the mine are clashing with reality and are creating these bottlenecks that question the production capacity of Codelco. That are questioning Codelco's production capacity historically and going forward in the near future. Many thanks to Jose Gonzalez, international director of our magazine Rumbo Minero. Don't forget Rambo Minero magazine, triple double rambominero.com. If you are a supplier or want to be a supplier to the mining sector, advertise in Rumbo Minero. Go ahead, Cesar. Yes, Jorge, it is time to introduce you. The AMSAC Mining, AMSAC Mining Assets. Activos Mineros AMSAC is a Peruvian public company with a great purpose to give life back to the planet. Thus, we are dedicated to contribute to the sustainable development of the country through Mining Environmental Remediation At AMSA C we recover areas affected by high and very high risk mining liabilities, which are abandoned or where the state has not identified those responsible. In this line of work, today we are present in 11 regions of Peru with a portfolio of 65 remediation projects, which are located in different phases. Promotion of private investment. In AMSAC, we represent the Peruvian state as counterpart of the transfer contracts of important mining projects. And we also supervise the fulfillment of the commitments and obligations that are part of such processes. Today, we are leaders in business management systems. Within the 35 companies of the FONAFI Corporation, by having certifications, made 9,001 in quality management, made 14,001 in environmental management, made 37,001 in anti-bribery management, and 45,001 in occupational health and safety management. At AMSAC, sustainability and care for the planet are our DNA, and therefore we are proud to contribute to creating a better world through the recovery of air, water, soil, and ecosystems impacted by mining liabilities. And thus, contribute to 10 of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals by the year 2030. Giving life back to the planet is more than a simple phrase for us. It is the guide of our daily actions, with which we positively impact the lives of thousands of Peruvian men and women, and through them, our country. Well, next, as we had announced, we met with Brendan Oviedo, President of the Peruvian Society of Renewable Energies. Of the Peruvian Society of Renewable Energies, we are going to talk about the portfolio of renewable energy projects in Peru. Brendan, how are you feeling? How are you? Thank you very much for the invitation. Brendan, tell us a little bit. In the Congress of the Republic was published the law, 31992 law, for the promotion of green hydrogen. Tell us what is the objective of this law and what benefits it would bring to the country. Yes, well, we are very excited that Congress has approved this process, initiated this process of energy transition. This project basically seeks to promote the development of technology, training, etc., regarding green hydrogen. We are really very happy. However, we have to point out that there is a little issue there with the 
that there is a small issue there with the definition of green hydrogen. The law mentions that green hydrogen is a hydrogen. It is a low emission vector. And in reality, I think there has been a confusion of terms because green hydrogen is a zero emission hydrogen, zero emission hydrogen. This has been highlighted in a communique today by the National Engineering University, which is basically a little concerned because let's say if a structure is being approved to promote this type of technology, it is not a, the idea is that the focus should be specifically on green hydrogen and not on a blue hydrogen or a blue hydrogen or a green hydrogen blue hydrogen or gray hydrogen that are obtained through the use of fossil fuels. See, but on the other hand, the Ministry of Energy and Mines Brenda is promoting a regulatory framework that is intended to regulate the environmental management of photovoltaic and wind energy generation as well. I don't know if you have analyzed the proposal. What do you think? How do you think about it? Yes, well, we have analyzed. That is to say, bureaucracy in Peru is unfortunately quite tedious for investors. There are many delays in the approval process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is an issue that is really very sensitive, which is the issue of prior consultation, which is going to affect the whole approval of project processes, of project development. I believe that this should also be linked to this proposal. Prior consultation should be included within the approval of the environmental impact study and not as an independent part of this process of approval of permits to reach the final generation concession. We are very much in favor of the ministry taking the lead in identifying these problems and trying to resolve them, try to solve them. However, I believe that before before unblocking projects, we need to create regulatory changes Focus. so that investment is allowed to enter the country, and that is what we are focusing on. This is precisely something that we are a little concerned about from the association's platform. Just talking about this issue, there is a portfolio of renewable energy projects for more than $4 billion. Tell us a little more in detail where they are when could they be implemented? Because we are talking about an amount that is already starting to be interesting for the economic dynamization of the market. Peru is one of the most, the most attractive countries in Latin America to invest in renewable energies. And this is because the potential is enormous. An enormous wind potential, a solar potential, if not the best in the world, of the best in the world with the north of Chile in the south of Peru. And the extraordinary thing about the opportunities to develop renewables in Peru is that the potential is decentralized, is that the potential is decentralized. It is decentralized in the regions, the central north and the south, even in the east in the highlands, the east in the highlands, projects have been developed, have already been built, and many more wind and solar projects are being developed. Solar projects, we have been informed that the solar potential in Puno is extraordinary. Not only in Arequipa, Mokebo, and Tacna, where we are mainly focusing the development of solar projects, are focusing on the development of projects and investment in solar projects. However, these developments, I insist again, are a bit stuck because there is no regulatory structure that allows investment in these projects, in these projects. Of course, relying heavily on hydroelectric generation also makes us a bit vulnerable, doesn't it? As a region, as a country, given the occurrence of droughts or the other phenomenon of intense droughts, droughts or the other phenomenon of intense rains, rains. In any case, how do you approach the effort made by the state to integrate all these hydroelectric, all these renewable energy matrices? What steps should be taken? Because from the expression I see in Yes, well, I think they have taken steps. I believe that the first big step was the creation of a platform called the Multisectoral Commission for the Reform of the Electricity Subsector. In the 2019, where they started to identify the problems that affect the electric-only sector, I believe that it was not enough. It should have been transversal because electricity affects mining and transportation. 
Uh, if we are going to move towards an energy transition, we must also electrify transportation. Uh, there is already a commitment under the Paris Agreement that we have to have more than 70,000 private electric vehicles and more than 6,000 public electric vehicles, electric by 2030. And we are way behind, just around the corner, just around the corner. Corner, finish, please. Yes, yes. And then I think that we still need to make some progress in really understanding that what we need here are not only political objectives, which still need to be identified. Uh, there has already been a meeting at the ministry with the authorities uh, linked to the energy sector in which an energy policy is going to be prepared and updated. However, what we always lack in Peru is a plan that defines how we are going to achieve these policy objectives. We are left with policies, but we do not identify how we are going to achieve them. Okay. Well, in closing, Brendan, you are the chairman of one of the Congresses at Spomina in September, the Green Hydrogen and Alternative Energies Congress. I guess at Spomina we'll be able to have this conference that you're chairing with. Talks about that and hopefully we'll have better news. From what you are saying. Yes, well, it has been an honor to receive this designation. We are already putting together the panels with obviously very high level national and international representatives. Uh, I think it is going to be an extraordinary opportunity to inform not only about the benefits, but also about the opportunities that this type of investment brings, not, not only to the people, but in general to the Peruvian economy. Excellent. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. Well, let's go now to Gabriela Chicoma, who has something to tell us about Spomina. Thank you very much. Expomina Peru, the largest and most important mining event of the year 2024, with 16 years of trajectory with the special participation of the United States as the guest mining country. Expomina Peru is the only Peruvian event certified by the United States Department of Commerce. Do not be left out and be part of this great mining event. Reserve your booth at Expomina Peru. For more information, visit our website www.expominaperu.com. Well, coming to the end of the program, Cesar, he leaves us. Miguel Castilla. Miguel Castilla left us all worried about what we did at the beginning, and he also touched on the subject of the terminal, the port of Chanque. Of the terminal, the port of Chanque. We hope that the minister, Raul Perez Reyes, will make a quick decision with the president of the, with the, president of the port authority, Walter Tapia, and that they don't really make us go through one more mess. It, and this is linked to what Luis Miguel Castilla Jorge was also saying, that we should not discourage private investment. We should not discourage private investment. Is it not true, especially in mining? Uh, we would like to highlight that in the PDAC, which you have also been present with Minister Romulo Mucho, the discourse is given to bring investments, but suddenly, whoa, an arbitrary, absurd measure comes from a third authority and an error of our own. Besides, besides recognizing an administrative error, that is unthinkable, isn't it? But it is also interesting, the interview with Brinda Noviedo about renewable energies, given that the Congress has already given already a norm that promotes green hydrogen, which will also be incorporated and assimilated in the energy matrix of our country, which we need so much. So it is undoubtedly a very interesting program with many points of view on issues that are really very important for the country. Thank you very much, Cesar. My name is Jorge Leon Benavides, and together with Cesar Campos, we have developed this program, Rombo Minero. Now, don't go away. In a few minutes comes Peru Construye.